Hello, welcome to The Cure. I'm Jonathan Kozlowski, editor of Concrete Contractor. I connected with ACAP professor Luna Liu of Purdue University. They're researching real-time concrete sensor technologies and how the Internet of Things can help you get the data you need about the concrete we all rely on day in and day out. I am a ACPA professor of Lyle School of Civil Engineering and also a director for Intelligent Infrastructure, a research center. So my day-to-day job, including research, develop new technology, publication, of course, also mentoring, educate PhD students, postdoc, scientists, and also part of undergrad teaching. So this is really coming for a very specific uh, problem in the industry where lacking of the good sensing methods or testing methods for understanding real-time concrete strengths. If you think about it, current compression or flexure testing, the standard actually it's over 100 years old, right? So we're using the very old technology, try to solve the current problem. It's about... Three years ago, Indiana Department of the Transportation has started to talk to me, say there is a very specific problem. The problem is because of no real-time monitoring strength methods, we don't know when we should open the traffic. So you cannot optimize your construction schedule. For instance, I give you an example, right? Some of the interstate highway needs to be opened within 12 hours, but there is only four hours for concrete curing since you have to do a lot of prep work, right? Remove old concrete and and then. So what's the strength of this four hours? We don't know. And and then we have to open the traffic, right? Or on the other hand, you could wait brick testing for cylinder for three days, typically industry standards. And then the traffic will be slowed down and everybody's sitting in the traffic and waiting for the traffic to open. So that's one example. On the other hand, if you're looking at vertical construction for the buildings, right? The entire schedule of the construction, it determined really for the concrete is one of very important and critical part, right? So how how fast can we remove the former? How fast can we pull the post tensioning cable? Currently, we don't have very good methods and it's more a guessing game, right? So there is not a lot of a human factors. So by using real-time monitoring methods, we can take that guessing part out of the equation can take in that human part out of the equation. So it's really accurately monitoring the strength development. So therefore, we can make a data-driven decision to optimize your schedule, optimize your cost, and optimize and reduce insurance, right, related and improve the safety factor. So there's a lot of benefits. To answer your question, because this is really industry need and it really coming from a real problem. So we worked with Indiana DOT on pavement project. Um, I don't know if you have seen that, that was last year. So we, we did on the three interstate highway and this year we did it with vertical construction and to see how we can help the, determine the building schedule. I understand that sensors is kind of a still of a new technology. Can you kind of walk me through how they work? Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. So our sensor is working is really based on wave propagation. So we build this wave stress relationship of the concrete. Okay. The sensor we use what we call the piezoelectric. So piezoelectric is scientific effect. You convert mechanical energy into electricity and vice versa. So by apply a voltage on this special material, we call it a smart material, the material will vibrate and then that send this elastic wave in the concrete. So by analyze the wave propagation, such as the effective wave pass and the wave speed, right? And then you get a lot of information about concrete that including your stiffness of the concrete, the strength of the concrete. And if there is any air voids and things like that, because wave travel at different speed at a different material, right? First, we developed this hardware. So it's a plug and play. If you put the sensor in there and then the vibrate sensor will get information. 
So, and another thing is we develop this algorithm, so mathematic and physical modeling and algorithm to interpret that wave propagation with the strength of the concrete, build that wave strength relationship. Okay. And then also a very user friendly interface. So therefore the engineer, the concrete engineer do not need to read a specific amplitude, frequency, spectrum, right? Rather than you read what is a PSI at what time. And then the prediction of the strengths going over the time, things sure. like that. Is that how yours works? Or is that kind of like a general explanation of all like oh, that's concrete so sensors? Great. That's a great question. So currently there is concrete sensor, right? So if you think about it, there is a concrete sensor called maturity sensor. You probably already know 10 company may be selling the similar technology. They all based on 30, 40 years ago mathematics. And what they do is to correlate the strengths with the temperature and the history of the temperature development. Okay. So basically what you need to do is you correlate the time and temperature factor, which we call TFF, with this strength development. So as such, you have to develop this correlation curve, which is called maturity curve in the laboratory. Typically spend seven days, right, or 14 days. It depends on the requirement and around $3,000 to develop this curve which is fine. But the biggest problem is this curve is a very mixed design specific. For instance, right? Yeah. So it's water cement ratio 0.42 that has to be that way. What happens, you in the industry, you know, in the industry, the property of the concrete can be easily altered during the transportation, during the placement. People put a bucket of accelerator, you know, for instance, I mean, Indiana, it's 40 degree or 30 outside. It's very cold, right? And they need an accelerator to get a hydration going faster. And then all of a sudden, your temperature history curve completely changed from your maturity curve. That means the $3,000 you spend to build that maturity curve cannot be used for this particular scenario. So I think that's the biggest challenge of a current sensors. So our sensor compared to the current sensor is really plug and play. We don't need to build that historical database. We don't need to build that reference, right? So you don't okay. need that extensive collaborate because you're just to measure what it is at this particular moment. Does that make, make sense? So that's the benefit of getting real-time data that's correct. Okay. So the so I think the biggest the benefit of getting real time data is to help engineer make a data driven decisions to improve your productivity, right? To optimize. For example, right. So if I know the concrete will reach to three thousand psi two hours later, and I can pull the post attention cable, so I can start the schedule all the steel workers for like for instance they can they can do the cage work or some other things, so we can keep them right, or you know, you, you, you can have a better optimized schedule. And a specific example I can give you to you is this Purdue Gateway project that the general contractor said because of using the sensor, they reduced, they were, the, the, the project that was bidded rather than 12 hour, 12 months, they can do 10 months. Okay. Because of, you know, the, the reduce of the time needed. Otherwise you have to wait for the cylinder break, right? And which is typically conservative, and also the cylinder break has a specific time, 24 hours break or three hours or three days break. But, you know, we, we did this project that they reached the 3000 PSI for post attentioning within eight to 10 hours. So it wow. depends on if a beam is a deck, right? So it's, it's a lot of time saving. Of course, you know, you save a lot of money because of that time saving you save the, the equipment money, rental, right, a staffing, workman's comp, insurance. So there is, a, I think, a, I think a, that's the biggest the benefits of the value, or if that's called value proposition of the technology, right? Sure. So the technology itself, I think, the compared to the current technology is the, the biggest advantage is we don't need to develop that maturity curve. Or, you know, you, you have to specifically develop that. And also, we it's not mixed design dependent. So become a mixed design independent. We could use in any scenario. Yeah. Well, currently, we're using concrete. I, I think we could easily extend this into asphalt, other construction material. 
yeah, that was going to be my very next question is how do you okay. adjust to the different mixes that are out there? Does this need to be calibrated at all? But I guess not. No, no, the sensor does not need to be calibrated because what you did is you build this wave stress relations for specific material. So for instance, the current algorithm cannot be used for asphalt, but it can be used for any concrete. Okay. That makes sense, right? Yeah. So, because asphalt is very viscoelastic material, and concrete, on the other hand, it does have that viscoelastic property, but way less than asphalt. So, there is a lot of mechanics in there as well. When a contractor inserts a sensor and it's doing its thing, um, it's connected to Wi Fi, I think. Oh, no, at this point, it's not. It's not. But that's okay. the goal. That's okay, that is the goal. Okay, but that's is goal. that sensor lost to time? Is it just trapped inside the, the concrete forever? Yeah, the sensor will be in the concrete forever. But we also have another version is you can directly attach to the surface of the concrete. It really based on what is the property you're interested, right? If you're interested, the bulk the average property of the entire beam, for instance, is 24 inch is pretty deep. And then you may want to put sensor in the middle. So in this way, you get an average property of the entire beam. However, in a lot of cases, we are interested in the surface property, you know, such as bridges and pavement, because where that's where the worst case scenario, right? That's mm -hmm. your lowest temperature. That's your mo most of the water evaporating. You know, your curing condition is most poor. So it really depends on where we're interested. You mentioned that you worked with the Department of Transportation from Indiana three years ago. How has the research changed? How has the sensor changed since then? So three years ago, we started the problem. The first, we have to understand what's the problem. And then we developed this, you know, algorithm. And then we go back mm -hmm. to develop the sensor, right? And of course, we thousands of the cylinder brick and testing in the laboratory. And we have seven, eight papers published and a lot of, you know, the invited to talk in this area. And I think first we approved a concept at the laboratory. And then we moved into a pilot study on the interstate and we approved that. And then we realized, that, okay, the biggest problem is inconvenient at this point, you know, using, using the sensor we developed we were still wired. We still need a laptop. We still need <laughs> some uh, big bulky devices, right? Okay. And and for instance, you know, the project that we were having a concrete pour at 4.30 a.m. And the entire engineering team has to be there at 4.30 a.m. And, you know, all the way to 12.30 p.m. Of course, it's very inconvenient to use, right? So therefore current work is really focused on miniaturize and the electronic devices and the wireless you know communication the data transmission so i think it, it really evolving is to understand what is the industry need right and how can we make a, the technology more practical more field deployable and helping the industry to move forward how long does the battery last in the sensor so the current, we did not use the battery because we're using external management oh, okay. de uh, devices, but that's a really good question. That's part of where optimizing power management is very important things. That's what we're optimizing. I think by, you know, February, March, I probably could tell you a little bit more about it. <laughs> so yeah. this is an ongoing research project that's probably going to end when? When do you anticipate? So, so we have a couple of research program related to this now one. It's with Indiana DOT. They sponsored phase two, which is on the wireless, on um, Bluetooth data transmission for, for DOT project, uh, you know, a lot of it remote. So they like to have a Bluetooth rather than wireless. It should be sometimes 2021, right? 2020. Yeah, we're at end of 2020. <laughs> so I'll call you around the holidays next year. Oh, okay. And yeah. Say, hey, what's have, up? <laughs> hey, I probably have something earlier. You should call me like May. Yeah. May. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Let's talk <laughs> May and June. We have, we have, we have a lot of new things going to be going on. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's one part. And also, Federal Highway, it started a, what we call the put fund research. Basically, this type of research is to ask different states to join and to see if they would like to implement. So we currently already have five states committed. 
and that including, of course, Indiana, Missouri, mm-hmm. and we have Texas, Colorado, Tennessee, and California is in the process to wow. join it. Yeah, so it's. Uh, I, I think that's going to be a. Um, or oh, we're working towards to become a nationwide um, study, and hopefully, and oh, and we're also working on developing ASHTO testing standards so we can uh, we can get it well adopted. Has anybody suggested a name for your sensor yet? No. Do you have a good? <laughs> Oh man, we I wish I would have thought one, man. <laughs> yeah. We have a couple of names it's uh, under process, but none yeah. of them confirm. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Where uh, I, is there any suggestion uh as far as your sensors go, where you place them in the concrete? Like is oh. there a depth? Um is there mm-hmm. any research as far as what area that you need to place these? Yes. So the location of the sensor is very important. That is really determined by what is of your interest, right? For instance, are you interested in a beam or deck? And different projects have a different interest. For instance, you know, for pavement project that you may not be interested in a bridge is very different than vertical construction, right? Post tensioning is pre-tensioning. So that has to be specifically realized or analyzed. And also it depends on, because any sensor, you always have a se- effective sensing range, right? And that effective sensing range is dependent on you know, how accurately you want to de- determine the entire pavement or entire bridge or entire, you know, deck or beam. Sure. And the current practice we did is about one sensor for one pour, something like that. Yeah. Okay. One concrete truck, you use one sensor. From what I understand, it's like mm-hmm. a radar or sonar being sent out into the into the mix. And that electric current is being... That's what's being collected. How far is that signal being sent out? That signal, effective sensing range can be tuned. At, at this point, we're using very small sensors, about okay. one inch by one inch, and that can cover about 12 inch radius. However, that being said, you can really tune that effective sensing range by a lot of things, by voltage you apply it, by frequency, of course, you know, higher voltage higher frequency, right? You could have different penetration depths, right? So so it, it can be tuned and also it can be tuned by the material itself. However, as the engineered product, you have to consider what is the cost, right? Okay. And the the, um, the device size, right? The form factor. So there is a lot of things. I mean, I, I learned a lot just uh, thinking about to bring this from lab to the field right in the lab you're thinking one thing but when you really talk to this industry practitioners you have to thinking about how convenient the sensor can be installed right sure. and I, I think there's a, just a ton of the factors were under consideration now i understand you also worked with i'm going to butcher this name fa wilhelm construction company um, as a contractor, what was it like working with them? What was their their input on the project? Okay, so that's a great question. Yeah, I really enjoy the working with them. So I think that they are as uh, either early adopter or you know um, they the potential customer. They give a lot of a good suggestions. So for instance, is really learning from them is the convenience of the data. Mm-hmm. processing methods, uh, data transmission, it has to be a uh, very keen on it. And, and then we also learn a lot about, you know, what would be the, for instance, I talk about installation, right? How, how easy the sensor to be installed and it has to be a plug play sort of form, right? And another thing, for instance, you know, what would be the potential cost? Uh, because Ultimately, you have to commercialize this, right? Either sure. me or somebody else. I don't know who at this point. Um, but to commercialization, to get into the market, to be acceptable, what is acceptable, you know, potential cost they can consider, right? And what would be the benefit to them? And what's the value proposition we can bring to them, right? Even this term I learned. Right, right. right. And 
you you mentioned data and it's like we're in sync today mm -hmm. um I, how are you helping the contractors understand that data i i think there is some uh, interface being developed yes so we are developing this uh user friendly interface so we can help them to convert the wave spectral directly into the compression strengths, right? Okay. Which is everybody familiar with the PSI. And also ultimately, you know, the goal is to use this as IoT sensor. And then they can all the all the data will be on the cloud. And then they can retract off their information. For instance, you know, Wilhelm, they have 10, 20 projects going on. <laughs> and they probably only have one or two quality control people who are monitor, right? The, the, the concrete projects. So uh, that project so can be anywhere, but with this IoT sensor, he can have direct access, right? They don't have to be travel to Florida and to see what's a project going on when he's physically in Indiana. So I think that that's really the goal. And also that's one of the goal for my center is how can we build this intelligent infrastructure? So making the infrastructure not only responsive but also infrastructure can be more sustainable, right? By looking at its sustainable material and the infrastructure can be more reactive and be part of the solution. Sure. Right? For instance, we are working use the sensor to understand the, the strength of the bridge after 30, 40 years in service, right? What is the, the strength of the concrete of the bridge? And do we know? I don't think we have a good idea, but now we're rotting all the heavy trucks going through every single day, how that uh, deteriorate or accelerate the deterioration of the bridge, right? Is there a better solution? So by using this type of IoT sensor, hopefully we can build this intelligent infrastructure and help people do better asset management sure. right? and project optimization. Are, are you saying that I can use one of these sensors and place it on an old concrete structure yes. just to see yes. how, what the strength is like. Yes, yes, yes. That's we, amazing. We, yeah, we can use that to see the residual strengths of the old concrete structure, particular, you know, my major concern is really a bridge because in the industry, you know, how many bridges are either structure deficient or in the obsolete condition because of most infrastructure in this country was built back in World War II, right? And it's it's really in the aging. And then we we need to prioritize what are, you know, with the limited funding, you know, what are the priority, right? Where is our urgency? What, you know, have the biggest threat to sure. the, yeah. Sure. You're going to make everybody uh, bring their smartphones onto the job site and be like looking at it with mix and heavy equipment going around, aren't you? <laughs> that's that's a goal, you know, smartphone, tablets, right? That's the goal. We really try to get rid of, uh, you know, current laptop and we're building the, the, the device on chip. So basically sensor on chip. So we're trying to miniaturize to a quarter size or... Wow. Yeah, something like that or handhold devices. So basically, you really try to make it very convenient. Small form factor is easy to be implemented. How does the, the algorithm, the math change from a foot traffic floor like you have at the, the recent work being done at Purdue versus the heavy traffic on a highway? Oh, um, Good question, but regardless, light or heavy traffic, it doesn't really affect too much of on the sensor because the frequency domain, because we were looking at it a way higher frequency than all the traffics, right? Okay. Yeah. So it just adapts to it and just gives you data and it's up to the contractor to kind of understand that data. Oh, no, no. We have no? a software to analyze the data and then, oh. then giving the results to the contractor. And also we can directly generate the report. Okay. We can automatically generate that report. Uh, particular for the DOT people, it's very important, right? They need to, they need to have the, the DOT engineer need to have the report. And, and sure. also can help to pay this and the pay schedule for the for the general contractor. Sure, sure. So so what's next for 
for Purdue's engineering team? What is phase two? Is there a phase three? Yeah, I think this is always evolving, right? The ways of research is always evolving. I think another thing we we are, you know, probably actively looking is is how can this technology be more broader using for other construction material rather than just the concrete, right? Sure. And concrete asphalt, right? And overlay, you know, there is a lot of a problem. And also, I am very interested in working, looking at the microstructure of the concrete and particular the air voids you know, the water cement ratio. And currently we just have not have a good understanding of those property, although those are the most important property to determine your compressions, not only compression strengths, your strengths, your durability, right? Your, you know, your ASR, your free fall. You know, I, I think if you think about it, any property of the concrete is really determined by those couple of important parameters. So unfortunately, we don't have a very good way to do that. Where does your passion for this industry come from? It's really coming from um, civil engineering in general, not only in concrete. And what I grown up in the family, my dad is, you know, have a civil engineering firm, you know, my, my back in China. So my father has a, a construction company and, you know, building a deep foundation work. And so I... Of course, my all my training is in civil engineering, right? Yeah. So he told me this is a great place to be, and <laughs> I didn't know it was right. I would just listen to my dad, and and I think over years with the training, I do find that. Uh, and I think another thing is you just to see the impact, right? You know, the concrete, this the sheer volume of the concrete. There is nothing can compare. Right. So the, the impact to people's life, the impact you can help to save the time, save the money, save lives. For instance, you know, in 2019, Hard Rock Cafe Hotel building yep. in New Orleans was collapsed during the construction because they removed the shoring too early. And imagine if we had that sensing technology at that time, we can just send alarm to the you know, contract your cell phone and say, hey, you can't do that. You cannot do this, right? You cannot do this. And then there was three people's life can be easily saved. And of course, a lot of property damage. And this year, the Michigan, you know, their flood of the dam and there was 2000 people's life, not life, the property, the home has affected, they have to be evacuated. I was just thinking this impact, it really is exciting, right? It's just the, what you can do to help the society and to um i think that that really excites me not only me but all my grad students my postdocs and of of course all the colleagues at purdue i think we're all excited for what we do (laughs) yeah well that's good that's good Uh, you gotta have excitement in your job (laughs) oh yeah absolutely right so honestly i don't feel it's a job you know and it's it is it it doesn't feel like it. it it does feel and, you know, it's a vacation. I don't know. It's a vacation, but it's <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's boring as a job. And every day you have a different problem. And another thing I think it's exciting is because once you solve this problem, there is a something else, right? For instance, sure. we solve the algorithm and then, then oh, OK, can you make a device? And then, then once you solve the device, can you miniaturize the device? OK, once you do that, OK, can you wireless transmission data? So I'm always learning, you know, I just sure. feel like okay, this is the best job Yeah, because you're always learning, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and the next in a few years for time, that's going to be all like, what else can we sense in the concrete? Can it right. heat up and melt the ice as it accumulates on the highway? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're working as well, you know, by using the thermoelectric technologies. There is a lot of things, you know, I, as you know, right? There is always a lot of uh, and when you solve a problem, there is a new problem coming. For instance, with autonomous vehicles, right? How can we improve the vehicle efficiency, yeah. mobility, and the security, right? And how can we develop a better IoT sensor, right? And to to help, you know, improve the mobility at the same time you you make sure it's security. Yeah, that would be really right. cool if the car could sense where that sensor is along the highway and just use right. that as a helping direct path. Right. That's a good question. That's actually what we're working towards. That's exactly the good thoughts. And if you think about current, it's really rely on GPR. But in this country, there are so many GPR 
de- de- denying the area, right? And particular rural area, if you think about it. And there is a lot of agriculture and the major manufacturer all located there. They they don't have very good wireless GPS um, database. So there is a lot of problem. I think as an industry, we can work together. Yeah. We also have to just work on making that battery last forever because. <laughs> <laughs> or, or how about self-powered, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just like turn the pressure of cars driving over it into electricity. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, this is not science fiction. I mean, this is going to be the science fact in a couple of years, right? If you think about it, there's a lot of a free energy on that road. You have vibration, you have deformation, you have a heat, right? Mm-hmm. All those can be converted into electricity. I think the, the 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 really the biggest challenge is the cost. It's not physics, you know. The physics, the device, we can work on it. It's cost. It's a policy. Who's gonna pay for it, right? It's you know this highway is <laughs> government or it's a private, right? You know who's gonna pay for it, right? Yeah. And how we're gonna use the data? So I think. There is, has to be a lot of a policy change and it has to be the, you know, I hope the government, the industry, academic can think collectively, right? I think this is a very important topic and we really need to think about it, how, how we tackle it collectively. I thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, time and taking a moment to speak with me today. I appreciate having you.